You can open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We want to welcome all of you to Eternity Church tonight. We're glad you're here. Kind of shifting gears again back to Wednesday night, not biblical citizenship night, but regular Wednesday night services. And I'll tell you, I'm kind of excited because we're embarking on a series that is very, very crucial for us to walk in the power of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 8, we'll begin with verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word, my servant will be healed, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found so great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Now Jesus showed us in the healing of the centurion's servant that there's a direct correlation between understanding authority, that is, being under authority and being in authority and walking in great faith. See, here's a man. He's not grown up in the things of God. We don't know how he gained this knowledge. Obviously, he must have been watching Jesus, observing his life, hearing the reports, so on and so forth. But because of his position and the fact that his heart was open, he received some very important revelation that led directly to him walking in great faith. Jesus marveled. doesn't say that Jesus marveled at very many things. But he marveled. And said, I've not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Implying that because the Israelites had been hearing the covenant, hearing the covenant, hearing the covenant, that they should have had what? Great faith. But he said, I've not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So what exactly... Did this centurion understand? There was actually four separate revelations that the centurion was walking in in order for him to make the statements he did. And these revelations were understandings of authority and his perception of authority in Jesus' life. Number one. Anybody can guess what the first one is? Found in verse 8. <laughs> Nobody wants to take a chance. First one is... I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Now, some people go, yeah, oh, see, he, he knew he wasn't worthy. Oh, no, that's not what he's saying. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, I know enough about the old covenant to know that this old covenant's not for the Gentiles. 
He's a Gentile. He's a, the word Gentile means person without a covenant. He said, I know I am a person without a covenant. You have not been sent to minister to me. And because I don't have that covenant, I'm not a proselyted Jew. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. That's revelation number one. What did he understand? He understood that he did not have a covenant. And because of that, he was not worthy that Jesus, a Jew, one with a covenant, should come under his roof. Amen. That's number one. Number two. But speak a word only, and my servant will be healed. Woo-wee. You know, even in the Christian realm, I have not seen a lot of people that understand this. Most of them need you to lay hands on them. You need, they need you to come to their house. You need, need you to anoint them with oil. Some, he says, just speak a word only, and my servant will be healed. Now, how could he make such a statement? Hmm? He understood authority. He did. He did. He understood authority. See, he obviously had been watching the ministry of Jesus. The centurion perceived the authority by watching his ministry that Jesus walked in had obviously observed Jesus casting out devils, healing the sick. He recognized that Jesus did not to be, need to be physically at his house to heal his servant. Speak a word only. That's Revelation number two. He didn't need Jesus to physically be there. Number three. For I am a man under authority. How does this relate to authority? He understood submission. submission. The centurion recognized that his authority... Now, a centurion's over how many men? One hundred. Okay? It's like century is one hundred years... Centurion means the leader of 100 men. He had 100 men under him. Now, was he bigger and stronger and more fierce than the 100 men? Hmm? No. What was he? He was a man under authority. Where did his authority come from? Rome, from Caesar, ultimately. Because you could trace his authority up to the person above him, to the person above him, to the person above him, and ultimately it's going to end up at Caesar. At this particular time, it was a Caesar Augustus. Okay, now, I'm a man under authority. The only way his authority was valid was if he was walking under and submitted to the authority that ultimately ended up at Caesar's. Here's the point. Here's the revelation. The more submitted you are to God, the more authority you walk in. How submitted was to God was Jesus? Totally and completely. How do we know that? John 5, 19. Hold your place in Matthew 8 here for a minute and turn to John, the Gospel of John chapter 5. Verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son 
does in like manner. In other words, Jesus was totally under the direction of the Father, their Heavenly Father. Totally submitted. But because of that, the centurion goes, I can see you're totally under God's authority, and that allows you to walk in great authority. Which leads us to Revelation 4, having soldiers under me. He had a hundred of them under him. How did this help the centurion understand Jesus' authority? What does he go on to say in that verse? I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. What does that have to do? Remember, he'd been watching Jesus. What did he see? Jesus was casting out demons, wasn't he? He'd say, go, and they'd go. He'd say, healing, come, and it would come. I have soldiers under me. So I am both under authority and I'm in authority. You need to understand you are under authority. You're in authority. You need to understand you have a covenant with Almighty God through the blood of Jesus. And you don't need, see, Remember, turn to Romans 10. This will illustrate this part of the scripture. This is not in my notes. This is no extra charge. Romans 10. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, We do not have to try to be good enough to be righteous because Christ is our righteousness. We do good works not to try to be good enough. We do good works because we are good enough because of the blood of Jesus. We do good works because we're going to get rewarded for those good works in heaven if we do what the Father tells us to do. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. So that's the the righteousness. There's still so much of Christianity that's still righteousness under the law. They were trying to do enough to be good enough. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. See, it kind of bugs me sometimes. I know, I know what people are saying, but sometimes it buzz, bugs me. You just need a touch from Jesus. That implies he's going to have to come down here and touch you. You don't need him to touch you. Speak the word only. Are you getting this? You see what the centurion understood? That's why we can speak the word only and be healed. We can walk in divine health as we speak the word only. We don't need Jesus to come down from above. That is to bring Christ down from above. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss or into hell itself to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. See, that's what it's all about. That's That's what the centurion understood. He said, I've watched you. You believe what you say. Just speak the word only. My servant's going to be healed. See, that faith, though, was based 
solidly on an understanding of those four revelations of authority. That he had a covenant. Amen? <laughs> that that all, because of that, Jesus didn't have to physically come to his house because he wasn't worthy that he comes under his roof because he was a Gentile. And number three, I'm a man under authority. All the way up to Caesar. But man, the might of the mighty Roman Empire would back him up. Well, we got something more mighty than the Roman Empire backing us up. We've got all the might of all mighty God behind us. All of heaven backs us up. And the more submitted we are, the more we are going to walk in his power. And we have the devil and all his demons are under us. Where are How far under? Under our feet. We got a message for the devil, write it on the bottom of your shoe. Just to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Over all the power of the enemy and... Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Sickness, disease, attacks, COVID-19, doesn't matter. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay? So the centurion saw how Jesus dealt with sickness disease, devils, and recognize all those were under Jesus and the authority he walked in. Just speak the word only. My servant will be healed. <laughs> I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. But God wants to find that great faith in your house, in your heart, coming out of your mouth. Well, the more you understand about authority... The more you understand the foundations of authority, the more you're going to walk in greater faith. Tonight, God put it in my heart to talk about faith in the name of Jesus. When Joseph Morris was here, he stated how now is the time for us to be doing the works of Jesus. How many of you remember him saying that? Okay. In his book, Resurrection Lifestyle, anybody read that yet? Start, I've started reading, I haven't finished it yet. Resurrection Lifestyle, he points out, Joseph Morris points out that we are to do these works in Jesus' name. We have to know something about the four revelations that the centurion had for us to walk in boldness using the name of Jesus. Now turn to Acts, the third chapter. Acts, the third chapter. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. I just want to point out something to you. Just to remind you, because this was, this was astonishing to me when the Lord said this to me. This man had been lame from his mother's womb. How many times did Jesus walk past this man? He was laid daily at the gate of the temple called beautiful. Jesus obviously went through this gate more than once. This man was never healed. Interesting. Even though the Bible says in John, the end of the Gospel of John, that the works, if, if, if everything was written down that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the books that would be written. That was just in three and a half years. Verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms. 
And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look on us. So they gave, he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew it was he who had sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder. See, that's what wonders do. And amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? As though by our own power of godliness we'd made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now you have to understand, this is not even a normal thing. Notice, it doesn't even really say that this man had any faith to be healed. What is this? What's in operation here? Gift of special faith. He didn't work a miracle. He didn't do anything. He just spoke it. He received a miracle. Now the man still had to do something. He had to get up and walk. But notice, in explaining this thing, he said, his name, the name of Jesus, through faith in his name. So for us to get to the point where we're even willing to say, in the name of Jesus. And you've got to have the unction to do it. You've got, but then you've got to have the boldness once the unction's there to do it. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. This man had been lame from his mother's womb. Amen. But Peter had that boldness to step out. Because he'd been with Jesus. He'd been with Jesus. Peter was the one who got out of the boat to walk on the water toward Jesus. All the rest of them stayed in the boat. Yeah, he sank, but at least he got out of the boat. Proverbs 28, 1, the second part of the verse, says the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked flee where no man pursues. No man's chasing. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? There's been so many people during COVID-19 that have been fleeing. Fleeing from COVID-19. Nobody's even chasing them. Because, see, they've, they've allowed the fear mongers to get them into fear. The righteous. Bold as a lion. We have to know we're righteous in Jesus. It gives us boldness. Amen. Turn to Mark 16. Mark the 16th chapter. Verse 14. Later, he, Jesus, 
appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So notice the first thing we've got to do. And sometimes, you know, I, 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 I've, I've made a mistake here. Because I have gone and I've laid hands on some people and they haven't gotten healed. And I said, Lord, what's going on here? He said, did you preach the gospel to them? Nope. See, what does God confirm? His word. You got to put some word out there for him to confirm. And the bolder you are about it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah the more he'll confirm. (laughs) He confirms his word. Look at verse 19. So then after Jesus had spoken to them, he received up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with and confirming the word through accompanying signs. But see, look now at verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. Doesn't say it'll follow apostles. Doesn't say it'll follow prophets or evangelists or pastors or teachers. Only. It says it'll follow those who believe. So if you're an apostle and you don't believe, it's not going to follow you. If you're a prophet, you don't believe, it's not going to follow you. Or an evangelist, you don't believe, it's not going to follow you. Or a pastor, and you don't believe, it's not going to follow you. Or a teacher, and you don't believe, it's not going to follow you. These signs will follow those who believe. What's the next three words? In my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will remove serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. See, one one of the reasons for praying over your food is if you eat anything deadly, it'll by no means hurt you. And people pray over their food, but they don't use the name of Jesus. In my name. In my name. Jesus said, these signs would follow believing ones. The believing is going to be greater when we're walking in an understanding of authority. So how does that affect us doing the things listed here in Jesus' name? First, we must understand we have the right to use the name of Jesus and all the authority it represents. Some people just want to kind of put the name of Jesus up on their mantle like a beautiful decoration and just kind of look at it. But Jesus has given that us that name to use. Not meant to be a decoration. Yes, it's something to be revered. Yes, it's something to be worshipped. But it's also something to be used. And not just for ourselves. To be setting the captives free. Causing the lame to walk and the blind to see, the dead to be raised. Amen. Every believer in Jesus has the right to use his name. When we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we enter into a blood covenant with Almighty God through Jesus' blood. Amen. We then become part of the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 30. For we are, talking about the believers, 
We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are the body of Christ. Question. What gives us the right to be on this earth? Hmm? That's right, being born here, having a physical body. That's why you got to take care of your physical body. Because if you lose your physical body, you lose the right to be here on the earth. Amen. When do we leave this earth? When that physical body dies. What happens then? Our spirit and soul leave the body and go to either heaven or hell, depending on who we, whether or not we made Jesus Lord or not. Amen. Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, obtained the authority back lost by Adam. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have what? Dominion. I think it's so interesting that the voting machines have that name. Because they're trying to steal our dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You know, sometimes I'm out in the garden and I'm either picking tomatoes or picking string beans. Earlier this year, when it was still, there was still moisture, <laughs> there was a lot of deer flies. And some of those deer flies would buzz and buzz and buzz. And I'd go, and I'd, I'd you know, lift up my hands, because they always land on the highest thing you have up. And so I'd lift up my hands to get them to land on my hands, and some of them were real skittish. And I said, listen, now I've got dominion over you. You're a creeping thing. You creep on the earth. I command you to land and land there long enough so I can kill you. <laughs> and you know what? Within a minute or two, they land. They stay there. I kill them. Then the next one lands, stays there. I kill it. I'm not bothered anymore. I have dominion over things that creep upon the earth. Now you can laugh about it, but I'll tell you, it works. If you'll work it, see, but you've got to believe that. You've got to believe you have dominion over those things. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have what? Dominion. Verse 27, so God made it, man, created man his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. That means use that authority to rule. Because why? The, the devil was there. Lucifer had been kicked out of heaven. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10? He said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. God kicked him out. He tried to ascend up. He said, I'm going to be like the most high. I'm going to ascend to the sides of the north. And poof, God, he, 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 he was like a lightning bolt. He was shot out of heaven so fast that he was like a lightning bolt when he hit the earth. Poof. Just like a little grease spot. Funny when Kenneth Hagin would say, he'd say, grease spot. Just like a little grease spot. Amen. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That include the devil? That include demons? That include fallen angels? Absolutely, a whole bunch of them. When did Adam lose this dominion, this authority? Hmm? 
When did he lose it? When he sinned. He committed high treason against God. When did we get it back? Jesus, Jesus took it back. Amen. And then he didn't keep it himself. Why? Because he doesn't need it up in heaven. There's no devil up in heaven. What did he do? Matthew 28. Verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, you go. He just delegated that authority to us. He said, all authority has been given to me and then boop. He said, you go. I'm giving you that authority to go. You take that authority and do all the things that he says there. Amen. Now, how did Jesus obtain that authority he delegated to us? He got it three ways. Three different ways. Anybody know what they are? Come on, you got to have some guesses. He inherited it. That's one way. Huh? His blood. What did his blood do, though? Well, it didn't just cover us. It washed sin away, which defeated who? Defeated Satan. He did number two, number one by inheritance, number two by conquest, number three. What's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ? Not judgment so much as it's rewards. Like Joseph Moore said, it's really the reward seat of Christ. See, Jesus was the first one to ever get born again, so he got rewards. What was his reward? He was given, what does Philippians chapter 2 say? A name which is above every other name. Name. The third thing, he got it by bestow. God bestowed upon him a name which is above every other name. But he didn't just give it casually. It's because Jesus was willing to go to the lowest place. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even beyond that, laden his spirit and soul laden with our sin went down into the heart of the earth, into hell itself for three days and three nights. People say, well, wait a minute. How could it be three days and three nights? We have to remember, when does Sabbath start? Huh? Sundown. So, see, it starts with a night. And then you got one night, then you got one day, then you got another night, that's two And then another day, and then the third night, and guess what? What we consider Easter is the third day. (laughs) Three days, three nights. God said, it's enough. Price has been paid in full. Woo! So number one, I'll do them the way I wrote them down, by conquest. Colossians chapter 2. And see, you've got to understand this. You've got to get this into your spirit so that you understand that, that this is not some casual something. Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and powers, that's demonic powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. This refers to the practice of the Romans who when they conquered a land would bring back a whole bunch of loot and booty, and they would have it, you know, piled up on carts and stuff. And then they'd have a whole uh, entourage or parade of prisoners that were in chains. 
Most of them probably stripped naked in humiliation. They would become slaves of the empire. And then would come the victorious army led by the commander. But the commander, he had somebody standing by him whispering something to him. Anybody know what it is? I mean, he's getting all this attention. Oh, man, the crowd's going nuts. They're clapping, you know, all this stuff. But the commander had somebody walking by him the whole time whispering something to him. Anybody know? He would whisper, remember, all glory is fleeting. All glory is fleeting. In other words, you're on the top of the heap right now, but you better remember, all glory is fleeting. So that why? So he wouldn't get so puffed up and wouldn't get so full of himself. All glory is fleeting. In other words, it's here today and may be gone tomorrow. And for the most part, it stood the Roman Empire in good stead. Amen. Conquest. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He fell under the power of God. And he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of Hades, hell, and death. Well, what are keys symbolic of? Authority. Amen. Amen. Only certain people have keys to the church here. Why? Because it symbolizes authority. Along with that authority comes responsibility. Some people want authority without responsibility. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. Jesus stripped the keys of hell and of death from Satan. Keys represent authority and ownership. Who can think of some people who obtained a great name by conquest? Alexander the Great. Yeah, <laughs> that's very good because Alexander the Great. Why? Because he conquered most all of the known world in a very short period of time. He was an absolutely genius military commander. He took on a force from Persia that was two and a half times his size. The rule of thumb is you should be at least three times greater as an attacking force than the person, the force you're attacking. Because they have the ability to defend, they can dictate some terms. He didn't have it, but he he had some brand new military tactics called the phalanx and some other tactics that absolutely turned the battle and never again was Persia a world power. He conquered the Persian Empire, which had been the greatest empire for a long, long time. Who else? Some of these are not nice people. Hitler, absolutely. Mussolini, he didn't conquer very much, but he he, he was pretty boisterous about what he was going to do, but he never did much. Attila the Hun, yeah. Attila the Hun was, was, he's one nasty fellow, but he conquered a lot of territory. And he's, his name is known. Who else? How about Genghis Khan? Conquered a lot of territory. Saladin. Ma, a Muslim conquer, conquered a lot of area. How about Julius Caesar? He was one of the greatest commanders the Romans ever had. 
Hannibal, Carthaginian's commander, took elephants over the mountains, which the Romans thought was impossible, and defeated Julius Caesar's army. One of the only defeats Julius Caesar has ever suffered. He had an inferior force, but the elephants were used to advantage, and the Romans weren't used to facing elephants. Amen. Okay. So that Napoleon, that's one other one that I wrote down. I mean, he conquered a lot of territory. And he ran into the same problem as Hitler. He tried to attack Russia in the fall, and he ran into Russian winter. And he was beaten by the Russian winter. Conquest. That's the first way. All right? By conquest. Jesus defeated the devil. Made a show of him openly. Number two, by bestowal. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Beginning with verse 5. Think about this now. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're, this, when we talk about the mind of Christ, this is the mind of Christ right here. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. See, even though we've been making, made childs of God, we choose to be servants of God. And make ourselves of no reputation, taking the form of bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death, on the cross. Hmm. Therefore, because of that, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those in earth, and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who's the only one who is accepted being subject to the name of Jesus? It's right there in that verse. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. I'll show you what I'm talking about. 27. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27. For he has put all things under his feet. That's God the Father has put all things under Jesus' feet. But when he says all things are put under him, Jesus, it is evident that that he, God the Father, who put all things under him, Jesus, is accepted. In other words, that's the one exception. Why? Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God the Father may be all in all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Would Jesus have gotten this name without humbling himself? No. The lower we're willing to go to humble ourselves, the higher God will take us. See, I know some people don't want to look foolish or stupid or be criticized or suffer persecution. You'll never go very far. You'll never get great rewards that way. You've got to be willing. Thank you to everybody who came out and protested with, with us yesterday. It was a few people from the church, Lori Richards and Scott Richards, Bruce Sabota, um, Robinson, and the Rotses, Maria and her and th- two girls, Mar- Marissa and Christina and Johnny, we're all out protesting yesterday. And, uh, you know, and most of the people were very positive, but there was a few people that held up one finger as they went by. 
in salute. I don't care. Why? Because it's our right. We should have the right to choose whether or not we have to take something. Amen. Especially when it doesn't work. Hebrews chapter 1. The third one, remember what, okay, we have by conquest, by bestowal. What's the third one? Inheritance, right. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory... And the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. Sat down at the right hand of the majesty at on high. Having become so much better than the angels. As he has by inheritance. Obtained a more excellent name than they. Now think about that. You know, First thing what people do is sometimes they'll go, oh yeah, that's all of God's angels. Well, yeah, it includes them. But who else does that include? Oh, <laughs> Lucifer and the fallen angels. Lucifer is now known as the devil or Satan. And all the fallen, they're angels. Yeah. He's been given a more excellent name than they. <laughs> By inheritance. Now, how do you get an inheritance? Somebody has to die. Well, this is a really unusual inheritance. Why? Because Jesus died, was raised from the dead, and he inherited because of his death. <laughs> and guess what? We're joint heirs with Christ. It was then. See, Jesus bore our sin to hell itself for three days and three nights, after which he was the first ever to be born again from the dead. It was then that Jesus inherited his great name. You say, wait a minute, born again from the dead? Where do you get that from? Colossians chapter 1. It's several places, but we'll just look at one. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 13. He, Jesus, has delivered us from the authority of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And by Him, all things were created that are in heaven and, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities and powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. He's before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Then in all things he may have the preeminence. He's the firstborn from the dead. Why? Why, why did he experience death? Because he bore our sin, and that sin separated him from God. That when that sin was laid upon him on the cross... It killed him. Then he bore that sin to the place of judgment, to hell itself, for us. It was then that Jesus inherited his great name. The ironic part is that you usually, don't, you usually inherit when someone else dies and leaves you inheritance in their will. Jesus inherited because his, of his own death. But inherited when raised from the death, dead to new life, part of his inheritance was a most excellent name. The most excellent name. We gain that right to use that name when we're born again and inherit to rise, the right to use it being in Christ. Glory to God. So by conquest, by bestowal, by inheritance, we've got a name which is above every name to use. And sometimes we can begin to just look at the name of Jesus and sound out the name of Jesus and, and, and we can begin to kind of take it for granted. And it loses the, the, the tremendous 
power and authority it's to carry. And you can't lose that. It's a name above every other name. Glory to God. We're going to continue on. Come next week, we're going to go ahead and receive our offering tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to come and be the sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for humbling yourself. And becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and all that came after that in hell, the suffering, the torment. So you could have that name which is above every other name. We just thank you now, Father, for directing us in our giving. Thank you, Lord, for grace to bring our tithes, to give our offerings as you direct. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed with that said, amen. If you're making out a check tonight, you make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, you want tax deductible receipt, raise your hand while the ushers give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. I just want to uh, thank everybody for your kindness, the cards, the gifts on Sunday for our 40th anniversary. We had a marvelous weekend, just a very, very excellent weekend, and the cards and the gifts made it special. Thank you, and we've already sent out thank yous to everybody who blessed us with, with gifts, so we very much appreciate that, but we just want to tell you, and uh, it means a lot. Hallelujah. You can uh, be praying for Linda Ellibrock. She's been attacked with um, COVID in the lungs and throat. Had a lot of coughing. And so I prayed for her yesterday over the phone. You used to be thanking that she's healed from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. But she was expressing regret to, to Doris that she couldn't be here for the 40th uh, anniversary. So I, we appreciate that. But... Uh, we understand. All right, anybody else need an envelope for cash giving? All right, let's all stand. Hold your offering up to the Lord. Say it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I bring my tithes. I give my offerings according to your word. I know I can't outgive you. I know I can't outgive you. You said that if I sow bountifully, I'll reap bountifully. I thank you for that. Thank you for I expect that. I, expect that. I, look forward to it. I look forward to it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, go ahead and receive the offering.